Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who do, know, who, do not, who do not know me, my name is Kelly Smith from the class of 2009. Thank you, thank you. That cheer would be louder, except that most of my class is still hung over, spread across various Airbnbs over New Haven. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to speak with you very briefly today about the SOM Alumni Association, SOMAA. I do have to confess, though, I was a little bit more excited yesterday before Anisha's show. Um, it's a tough act to follow as one of the only other uh, alums who's speaking, and I really only had one joke. Um, I was speaking with a couple of my classmates last night about it and sharing my anxieties, and they're like, Kelly, don't worry about it. You're by far the funniest person in our class. I'm like, I don't really know if that's saying a whole lot. <laughs> I, think, I think the class of 2009 does some things very well. Drinking is one of them. Um, so today, um, speaking a little bit about um, SOMAA, um, I'm also joined by a number of other board members who are here. Uh, and for my part, um, I am the chair of the Careers Committee, the Career Management Cari uh, Committee, as well as our treasurer, and I sit on our executive board. So it's very fancy, and all it just means I'm an over-involved alum. Uh, and today I'm joined by a few other board members. If they're here, I'd ask them to stand up and give you a bit of a prom wave. <clears throat> if anyone would like to cheer for them because they put in a lot of hard work into the SOMAA, I will not deny you. So first up, working in reverse order, is Jay Reddy from the class of 2004. <laughs> Dean Blackman from the class of 1999. I think I see him. Patrice Wolf from 1989. Uh, not here, but, uh, but on the board is Carrie Deneen from 1984. And from the class of 1978, which is not their reunion year, but here with his, with his wife, is Rob Cortell. Um, so together we, we serve with 21 other board members um, on the board, and as you may not know, all of them are nominated and elected by you. So we serve uh, at your pleasure largely, as well as the pleasure of the school. Um, and we have a very fancy mission that I'm going to read to you because I did not memorize it. Shame on me. The Yale SOM Alumni Association exists to be a voice for alumni and to promote a lifelong community of personal, professional, intellectual connections among alumni and to the school. We work to strengthen connections within the Yale community and local communities across management fields and across sectors. So today I'd like to briefly highlight three quick topics about SOMAA. Uh, the first is, what have we done for you lately? Uh, so SOMAA uh, has funded, uh, with the help of alumni relations, <clears throat> and hosted through the regional chapters, 160 events in the past year. Uh, ranging from happy hours to faculty visits and symposia on various topics, a lot of industry leading topics in healthcare and energy and finance. Uh, we've also hosted 15 webinars, again, from varying topics from career management uh, to entrepreneurism. The regional chapter committee, which is a big workhorse of the alumni association, in which we have uh, Tanya Chermak is here from the regional chapters committee. Tanya, where are you? Are you in here? Right here? Um, they have stood up a number of new tools to help foster uh, chapter growth uh, from an international perspective and sending up a, a number of uh, new, new initiatives uh, from, a, from a regional chapter. And the Career Management Committee, my own, is a personal plug. Uh, we work with CDO to expand uh, and the school to expand the uh, range of alumni career services that are available to all of you. So I'm sure from your various years, you probably all had varying experience with, with experiences with CDO. Uh, but in the last couple of years, CDO has expanded uh, a number of, of recruiting uh, and job searching and networking tools for you, including a, a, a partnership with a new professional uh, career management organization called AIRS. And there are a number of new tools uh, on the alumni portal, which I encourage you all to go look at and take advantage of. I'd also like to personally thank CDO, the staff, and Julia Zupko. Um, as some of you probably saw from uh, the agenda materials, yesterday they offered about five hours of one-on-one -on -one career counseling sessions, which I hope you all took advantage of, and a great session on elevating your personal brand. They also have a table out in the front near registration. If you want to stop by and ask any questions about services available to you or schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions you know, after you leave from reunion, um, they're wonderful, wonderful staff, and I encourage you to take advantage of that. 
Um, <clears throat> secondly, we need your input. So SMAA is drawn from, all, from our population. We're always seeking your input to stay relevant and provide you with resources and tools and opportunities from professional development, networking, uh, lifelong learning. So there is a survey that we run biannually. Uh, there's a hard copy, again, out in the front that we're going to ask you to fill out while you're here. On a happy note, I will tell you that we're incentivizing you, and there will be a raffle for anyone that fills it out today. Uh, some goodies that you all want. Trust me, you totally want them. Uh, there will also be an online link uh, for you to take it if you didn't have a chance to fill it out today. Please fill it out. It's very helpful for us to, um, to basically help us help you. And finally, ways to get involved. So there are a number of ways to get involved. Um, first is from a leadership perspective. So with SOMAA in and of itself, as I've mentioned now multiple times, and I'll say probably at least once more, uh, we are nominated and elected by all of you. So with a growing alumni base, with a growing alumni base of um, about 7,000 now and going to be uh, moving up to over 8,000 over the next few years, uh, we look for all of your engagement uh, to either self-nominate uh, or to nominate others from your class or others in your community uh, locally. The nominations process. <laughs> the nominations <laughs> process. <laughs> I, I'm, all, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Uh, yeah, you're, we're going to have to take a picture later, a selfie. We'll do, we'll do an Oscar selfie or something. Um, so the, uh, the election process is actually about to get kicked off in a couple of weeks. And that will start by getting, you'll get an email uh, to nominate yourself or, or others that you know for leadership positions. And then you'll get a, a further email, again, lots of emails, to then elect from uh, a slate of those candidates. And those people will then start in April and serve a three-year term on the board. Um, the next way to get involved is through our regional chapters, as I mentioned, the workhorse of SOMAA, led by Tanya Chermak. There are 52 of them currently spread throughout the world, and they're a great way to get involved both in terms of attending their events as well as taking on leadership opportunities in those chapters to be hosting events, connecting with fellow alumni, connecting back with the school, uh, and again, sort of uh, along the lines of lifetime learning. Tanya will be out uh, at the table for SOMAA again in the front area, so I encourage you to go and meet with her and learn more about maybe chapters in your area that you didn't know existed uh, or other ways to get involved. If anyone wants to start a chapter, yay. I will give you another raffle prize. Um, and finally, there's a lot of other ways to get involved, two of which I'll highlight. Um, Chris Galvin emailed you about this earlier this week, um, two very paramount ones. One is participating in our, alum, uh, our student mentor program. So all the current students, um, they have the opportunity to sign up uh, and register to get mentorship from all of you. Uh, so we encourage you to participate, um, sign up for that. It's usually an ask of mentoring one or two students. It's a pretty low level of effort. I've done it for all the five years that I've been at, and I find it personally gratifying to impart knowledge on all of these young minds and talk about it myself extensively. <laughs> um, and second is referring uh, potential candidates to admissions. So one of the best sources of, of highly qualified talent that are also a very strong culture fit are all of your recommendations and referrals. So please look at the email that Chris sent. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about it more, as well as the other uh, board members that are here uh, to, again, sort of refer highly qualified folks, and let's keep them away from HBS and other places that I will not mention. So um, in closing, um, something that my, my fellow O-Niners will appreciate I was a runner-up for a commencement speech. <clears throat> I'm not bitter about it at all. So, so I would like to conclude by reading my speech. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but seriously, the, um, I'm not gonna read it, I'm not gonna read it. Uh, I thought about it, I really did. It's short. Um, so the theme, the theme from that speech um, was actually about the greatest generation and how they had overcome a uh, considerable amount of adversity culturally, uh, politically, socioeconomically. And they'd done so with significant character uh, and courage. And in, in my speech, I, I drew the parallel, which I'd like to also draw today, on our times. And the fact that you know, we, we live in an extremely exciting time with all the different technology and social change going on in the world, and one that also has a lot of its share of similar challenges, socioeconomically, politically, interpersonally, maybe, for some of us. And while, uh, while obviously none of us come from the greatest generation, I do think there is a parallel, and we obviously transcend many generations in here, there is a parallel with the SOM community. 
and looking, looking to all of you um, and in, in kind of partnership with the school and reflecting SOM's mission of educating leaders for business and society, that we have a tremendous opportunity to be living out that mission every day and now sharing that mission and sharing those values and overcoming those challenges and taking advantage of opportunities, leveraging the kind of new platforms and, and infrastructure the school has put in place by our growing uh, international identity as well as our greater connection with broader Yale. So with that, I thank you for indulging all of my commencement speech hopes and dreams. And it is my personal pleasure to introduce two men who really need no introduction, the Dean of Yale SOM, Ted Snyder, and the President of Yale University, Peter Salovey. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> So, so, uh, so thank you, Kelly. It's great. You're a wonderful member of SOMA. Uh, welcome, everybody. I would like to pose uh, five hypotheses for why there are so many people here. Uh, we have a record reunion, so welcome back to uh, Yale, uh, SOM, and uh, Evans. The first hypothesis is, of course, that the 04s and 09s are the best classes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Second is that is that you wanted to see, you know, the the, the new digs, and um, you know, I am impressed. You're impressed. This guy Foster is sort of smart. That, you know, I couldn't figure out if I was supposed to call him Sir or Lord or Norman or whatever, but uh, yeah, it, he's he he got a few things right. Um, third is that we have a tremendous effort to get you here, and I, I, I wanted to thank some people, um, Cindy Charlesworth, Sylvia Jones, and Kayla H Hayslip. So we had a great team effort, so I want to thank all, all of them. <clears throat> fourth, fourth, you're really you know, ex you know, increasingly excited about the school and, and you know, the uh, abiding commitment to mission. Uh, you're gonna hear more from Dean Donaldson about how the schools evolved. You're gonna hear from uh, my colleagues, Andrew Metrick and uh, David Bach about uh, scale and scope tomorrow. Uh, but there's, I think, excitement about uh, what's going on at the school. And then the fifth hypothesis is you get to hear from President Peter Salovey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the good news is these are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> so, uh, so welcome, Peter. Thank it's you. It's very nice of you. I, I know you're extremely busy. We're both going to China um, in a very short time, and, and you've got a few things on your plate. So we, we do appreciate you joining, and uh, you've been very generous with your time, uh, spending time, for example, when, when students arrive here, which uh, we've noticed is, is pretty distinctive. But I would like to just, and by the way, this is going to be mainly dialogue. But I'd like to just frame um, this a little bit by, by getting Peter's experience uh, with, with Yale SOM on the record. And I think, you know, I think I've been here for, you know, this is my, you know, fourth year. I think this is Peter's fourth decade at Yale. And uh, so you came when to Yale? So uh, first of all, before I answer that, thank you, Kelly, for those opening remarks. Thank you all for coming back. It's really an important way of uh, reinforcing the sense of community here at SOM, but also Yale University-wide. And really do thank you for making the effort for coming back. So uh, thanks, Ted, for the introduction. And uh, I came to Yale in 1981, and I came as a graduate student in psychology. And I was in the clinical psychology program, but I mostly operated as a social psychologist. So we are, in many ways, we are kind of the nearest neighbor from an arts and sciences field to, say, the field of organizational behavior. And so in those days, there was a lot of uh, back and forth. Not, the school wasn't as intentionally tied to the rest of the university as it is now. Uh, but there was still a, a, you know, a tendency to want to walk up the street. We were at Two Hill House, we walk up the street and, and find uh, SOM, uh, which of course at the time was the School of Organization and Management. And uh, uh, as a graduate student in social psychology, I had professors up here, here metaphorically, it wasn't in this building, uh, like uh, uh, Rosabeth Cantor 
and uh, uh, Richard Hackman uh, and Vic Vroom. And, um, you know, they, uh, they, uh, they really rounded out uh, the education that we were getting in, in psychology with people like Bill McGuire and Bob Abelson and Irving Janis and Judith Ronan and others. And uh, what was interesting, of course, was that the, the, the issues covered were pretty similar, but the, the method of, 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 of trying to find truth was so different. And I don't have to get into it, but you know, the, the psychologists generally were running uh, experiments in labs, often with 18 and 19 year old uh, subjects, uh, where there was a lot of um, precision and a lot of ability to control extraneous noise and a lot of ability to make causal statements, but maybe an inability to generalize whether any of this was going to matter beyond the setting in which we were looking at it. Come up here and it was kind of the opposite. A lot more um, you know, case study approach, in-depth in look at, at particulars. Uh, at that time, not as much experimental uh, and very little lab work. Uh, and so um, you know, the opportunity to generalize was what was driving the conversation. Uh, but then, of course, to a psychologist, I had all looked a little sloppy and loose around the edges. And, and you know, how could, they make how could they make a conclusion like that based on such flimsy data? You know, so we were, <laughs> you know, so it was actually kind of fun. You know, they had this back and forth all the time about, about what constitutes evidence. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, students in SOM and the students in psychology would get into it a good bit. That also happened um, uh, when we would go over and take courses in the public health school which in some ways has a similar orientation, more practical orientation. And uh, my wife happened to be, uh, uh, at that time, she was a graduate student in the public health school, and that's how we met. Uh, and uh, I remember one of the earliest arguments that we had. <laughs> We've been married almost 30 years, so you know, isolating the earliest argument, it's not t totally clear in my mind. <laughs> but but was, was about that issue, actually, you know. Uh, but from a public health perspective, anyway, I know that sounds completely <clears throat> ridiculous and you're feeling sorry for me right now, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun and so, there was a lot of back, there was back and forth between psychology and... Uh, so between now and yeah. then, are there any, you know, just things that just jump out in yeah, terms yeah. of differences between... SOM back then and now? Yeah. I mean, you've been involved, you've had a secondary appointment, You've had all these responsibilities at Yale. Now you're you're running the show. Um, yeah. What what pops out in terms of difference? I think uh, you know. I think that when you look at the mission right up here, it, it sort of captures what what has changed. Particularly, uh, you know, number two, it, we were not a very global university in the early 1980s, anywhere, and uh, SOM didn't feel particularly international in those days too. There was some. There was international students and such, but there was no. Again, no deliberate effort to situate management in a global context uh, at all. And almost every, I mean, when I think about the courses I took with those wonderful faculty members, I don't remember an international perspective being a part of any of it, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has certainly changed. Um, I would say that being purposefully integrated with the rest of the university, which really and we could talk about how size and how scope and scale fits into that if, we, if you want, but uh, which really is so purposefully a part of the mission now. I think then it happened, but it happened in more accidental ways. So because people like Victor and Richard Hackman were psychologists, uh, we would find them. Uh, but, um, but it was almost incidental. There wasn't as much of a deliberate attempt and, I, and I, I don't, this is my impression, and I might be wrong about this. In other fields where, where faculty at SOM touched faculty in other parts of Yale, let's say uh, in economics or in something having to do with uh, environmental studies and sustainability, I think it happened much less. I think it was much more isolated in those days. Uh, and of course, you know, in those days, it, we, we were proud that we had a very quirky, a small, quirky business school. And, uh, I think we're still proud that we are a quirky business school. Uh, 
Uh, but we're quirky in ways that, are, that people recognize, uh, I, I think I'm more apt to recognize from the outside uh, 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 than, uh, than they were then. That doesn't mean it wasn't interesting then, it wasn't an intellectually vibrant place, it very much was. But, um, uh, but I, think, I, think, I, think, I think our niche is better understood so, now than so, it was then. So let, let me pick up on, the, on one part of the, the phrase that uh, prompted the reaction, um, <laughs> small. And, uh, and this quirky, small and quirky. I w okay, we can reverse it. <laughs> um, how important is quirky? <laughs> you know, what does it mean? You know, I, uh, I grew up, I grew up in a, in a uh, middle class Jewish family in New Jersey, and my grandparents were immigrants who came to this country with nothing. And, and I'm five foot seven, so I always thought my arrival at Yale was characterized, was characterized by the phrase small and quirky, actually myself. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I think, I think, I mean, what, what's quirky? What it really means is distinctive niche, I think. And, and not by trying to emulate or ape or, you know, be something else. You know, there are wonderful business schools in this country, you know, and, you know, Harvard has a certain style, Wharton has a certain style, Stanford has emerged uh, as having a particular focus. Uh, but so has Yale, and, 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 it, and it has emerged to have a focus that has very little to do with Harvard or Wharton or Stanford. It's its own thing. And I think um, when people think, well, we were quirky then, but we're not now, I think they're wrong. I think if quirkiness means distinctive mission and not trying to be something that we're not, um, uh, we're quirky, and, and I think it's important. I think it's important. You'll we'll take it. You'll we'll take it. I'll tell you my my. So uh, Ted knows this. Uh, I have a brother who uh, runs a theater in San Diego, and uh, teaches acting as an adjunct at UC San Diego. And uh, unbeknownst to me, SOM actually brought him in uh, to do some workshops during orientation this year on uh, public speaking for business school students. He was really uh, good. And I, I guess they went well. Uh, my brother, of course, calls me three days before he, he's going to come to this and says, could he stay with me? <laughs> you know, so I, like, you're coming to New Haven? You know, this is the first I'm hearing about it. Anyway, um, uh, he, so he told me there was this wonderful moment. I was asking him how the workshops went. And he said, well, there was this wonderful moment. I had all these first year MBA students doing a theater exercise where they, I, I don't know what exactly what it was, uh, but where they were staring at each other's faces four inches apart and um, having to describe what they were saying. I, can't, I don't know what it was, some, some flaky theater exercise. And, um, <laughs> and so I said to my brother, I said, uh, well, how did they like it? He said, oh, it made them totally uncomfortable. And I said, well, you know, you must have sensed that. What did you say to them? He said, well, I just looked at them and I said, they're not doing this at the Harvard Business School. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and people loved it, you know. And so, you know, that, that really, I mean, that story has a point. <laughs> and let me just take a minute to see if I can retrieve what that was. The... Uh, <laughs> I think we're going to be, I think we are and will continue to be uh, a great school of management because we're going to do our own thing. We're going to be different. And uh, uh, Ted, Ted uh, when he arrived here a few years ago to be our dean, uh, even though he was a great dean at, uh, at, at two other wonderful places, uh, you know, didn't say, I, mean, I remember when we were talking during that process, uh, didn't say, you know, I'm gonna we're going to turn Yale into Chicago, or we're going to turn Yale into Darden. Or we're gonna That's not what he said. He said, we're going to figure out what Yale can be and do, and, and uh, building both on its history, but also on what the world needs in management, and we're going to do it. And uh, I, think, I think you see it up here. It, it is a distinct mission, and it's, it, we're very so, proud so, of it. So, so let me ask you about the small part. Yeah. So... <laughs> And, and, and then we'll open this up. Uh, so, and it's, uh, it's a great time to, to you know, have at it in terms of anything. Um, the small part, um, 
I was out at Stanford recently doing a review of their business school, and they're, they're now at 410 in terms of entering class, and the students were saying, you know, this is really important. 410 is just perfect, <laughs> you know. And it's just very interesting. Um, but, you know, Yale likes small. And you've made a commitment to increase the size of Yale College. And uh, congratulations on, on reaching the, the necessary fundraising goals to do that. So that's not, I, my understanding is that's, you know, that hasn't changed for a long time. Yeah. And uh, our school has increased the size of the full-time MBA. I came here, it was uh, 230. And we brought in a class of 322. So basically, you know, a More substantial basically. increase. Yeah. And, um, but as you look around Yale, what's, what's your sense of Yale like small going forward? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I, I don't think there's any magic numbers, whether it's uh, you know, 410 or 330 or whatever. Uh, it's interesting, though, that the expansion of Yale College uh, from 5,300 students to 6,100 students, about a 15% increase, doesn't actually change our size ranking for our undergraduate program in the Ivy Plus group. We're still where we are. Uh, we also had not expanded since, essentially since co-education in about 1970. So 40, year, 40 plus years at the same size. But what did change? What changed was uh, the applicant pool went from about oh, 6,000 people to 31,000 people. What changed was an endowment that went from, I, I don't know what it was, a billion or so to, to $23 billion. And a faculty uh, of arts and sciences that was about 550 to almost 700. Uh, in addition, you know, all those residential colleges where the undergraduates live all got renovated. And you sort of say to yourself, gee, you got a stronger faculty, a stronger endowment, you fixed your facilities after kind of letting them fall apart. Uh, and, uh, and meanwhile, you've got 31,000 applicants to say in the, fa oh, and I would add one more thing, and you have states disinvesting in, pro in public education. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and meanwhile, 31,000 students want to come here every year. And you say to yourself, nope, nope, nope. We're not going to be, we're just going to wall ourselves off from all of that, pretend it doesn't happen, and be the same size we've always been, and, and just run a 6% admit rate, and we're happy with that. I, to me, it felt morally wrong. And uh, that I, you know, it, the decision to increase by 15% was not made because this would make Yale more powerful or have more impact on the world. If it does, great, I'm not against that. But it was really a different kind of decision. It was, are we really happy taking 6% of an applicant pool given uh, the strengths of our, our financial position, our faculty, our, our um, facilities, and what was happening elsewhere in terms of investment in higher education? So, you know, the, so the size issue has a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, context uh, to it. I will say this, though. Yale leads in so many areas not by being the biggest. That is true. You know, let's just take our law school. Our law school is undisputably the best law school in the country. And it does that by being one of the smallest. It is substantially smaller than Harvard, Stanford, you know, the law schools it competes, it competes with. Uh, so I, I don't think, we often get, when I was provost, people coming, almost every day somebody was in my office arguing, uh, two things. One, we have to be bigger and we need a new building. That was, you know, I, I would almost say, you know, I, you know uh, if this meeting's about being bigger and a new building, got it, next, you know. <laughs> we don't even have to have the conversation because I know what it is. But, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes that is exactly what's needed. It was needed in SOM, right? We were, we were scattered in these little buildings that were not very well suited to, to management education. And we probably were, you know, being small was still good, we were still kind of small, but we probably were too small to really have the global impact we wanted to have and to, take, and to really take advantage of other, other parts of Yale through joint programming and joint degrees. All right, so why do I think this is good? I think Yale is in a sweet spot with respect to both scope 
and scale. In scope, we are pretty broad. So, uh, you know, look at our array of a dozen professional schools, uh, 50, more than 50 PhD programs, and for undergraduates, 80 majors. Okay, that's incredible scope. And look, you know, look at other places, Stanford, Princeton, none of them have that scope. They don't have that scope, Harvard does, but, but they don't have that scope. Meanwhile, with scale, almost every one of those units, almost every one, probably 90% of them, are small relative to their competitors. And as a result of having this broad scope, but at the unit level, small scale, we can bring pieces together much better, I think, than anybody else. If you don't have the scope, if you're, I don't, I'm not speaking negatively about other places. Everybody has their mission, and these are great other places. But if you, have, if you don't have the scope, like Princeton, uh, or if the scale is too big, like Harvard, you, either, you, you don't have the units to bring together, or, it's just, or you're turning the Queen Mary. You just can't, can't do it. And so when I look at just in the last couple of years, joint programs between the School of Management and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and uh, talk about arts management and connections to the four schools of art, arch art, architecture, drama, and music, and um, uh, connections uh, to law, and connections to public health. And, and I say, this is, you can't do this if you don't have the scope. And if the scale is too big, you don't want to do it because it's just too hard. You can't, it's too hard. Uh, you know, uh, a river runs through it and separates uh, the schools. That's not a metaphor. That is, <laughs> that is a description of another place. And, um, <laughs> uh, right? But you can do it here. You can do it here. And I think it, it lets this place carry out a mission of, 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 uh, which involves being uh, integrated with the rest of the university in a purposeful way uh, that is unlike any other school of management. Uh, I think it will also produce the most distinctive uh, and best educated leaders for all sectors throughout the world. I mean, I, 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 think, it, I think it fits with the mission uh, very well. That's not an accident, uh, obviously. So I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to you for questions, but I'll just pick up on that with a story. There was a uh, a Yale College grad who then went to Wharton and was doing the college tour uh, for uh, the, the, uh, the junior in the family and uh, was going to Penn and taking, taking uh, the child around and uh, at one point the child turned to the parent and said, Mom, did you really go here? <laughs> And the point was, the Wharton experience was so disconnected from the rest of Penn, the child said, I, I'm not really sure you even went to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I think your, your sweet spot point is exactly right. Um, so questions uh, about Yale, School of Management, anything. Uh, there's one right here. We've got microphones. Um, Chris is going to get here. And then, um, yeah, fire away. Uh, one perspective I think that sometimes gets left out of the conversation about what the school wants to do is that of the business. And my personal experience is as a hiring manager at a $60 billion enterprise. And what happens each year is there's a question about your return on investment for going to a particular business school. So sending people to a business school requires resources, you know, plane tickets, hotels, things like that. And the question that happens each year is, what did we get for what we spent the year before? Scale does matter. I think you guys are absolutely right. And uh, scope does matter. But I, I applaud your efforts to move you know, to a larger school, because otherwise it's going to get very difficult to get other organizations to even consider coming to Yale if they're not able to get some sort of return on that investment. Yeah, so, so we have um, an interesting situation now and uh, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid a long answer because uh, there's, there, there are a lot of go, go ahead. I didn't avoid a long answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but one of the things that I recognized when I came here is that for mm -hmm. our size, 
we have the most diverse set of students coming in in terms of career interests. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that, the faculty like it, the rest of the students like it. But this puts an underscore on your question because if we, if we are small and we wanna honor that because we, we actually believe that diversity of career interests correlates with things like broad-mindedness and connections to all sectors, then this question of how do we get companies like yours is important. So this is a challenge for the school. I, I can just tell you that we've had a lot of success just in this season in getting companies to commit to having Yale SOM be core schools, core for their recruiting purposes. So our team broadly defined is doing a good job. That said, I think scale leading to traditional on-campus recruiting is not as surefire a process as it used to be. What do I mean by that? I mean the world is changing so that more business schools are being faced with the challenge that we've had for a long time where students want to go out and do so many different things. So along with working with, with uh, traditional recruiters, we've got to get into a mindset of supporting students so that they think about opening doors, closing doors, sharing information, getting their narrative. Peter's brother coming in was extremely helpful. And, and uh, this is the, the kind of uh, exciting challenge that we're taking on now. Katya has handed the mic over here. Yeah, good morning. My name is Val Jones, class of 84, deep in quirkydom. <laughs> yeah. And we get, there's a lot of us here, too, um, percentage-wise in our class. Um, I, we've just come from a session where we had heard the results of a survey that some of our classmates did with all the rest of us. And um, we, some of the topics were, what were, are the things that you learned here that were the most important? What are the things you wish you had learned? What were the courses that were the most helpful? And there was a lot of diversity, but there was, a seems to me, a trend. And the trend was leadership, um, personal skills, organizational skills, people management skills were among the ones that were the most important. And also sometimes the ones where we wish we'd had more. Um, negotiation and that sort of thing. Um, and that's the, to me that is what SOM really can do, can offer, that is unique. And I don't know if, we've, if we are doing more of that or less of it, that's one of my concerns. And in particular, um, there was a course in 1984 um, that all freshmen first year had to take. And it was called Individual and Group Behavior. Mm -hmm. It was the single most important thing that I did here in two years, I took a lot of finance courses. I had a career in real estate finance. Still, IGB was the most important thing. I learned about um, how teams work, where the, real, where the real brilliance is on the team that may not be where you think it is, um, how to take a lot of data and come up with a whole bunch of different theories about what's really going on instead of just locking onto one, um, the importance of how you enter a relationship any relationship, a business relationship, a negotiation relationship, a hiring relationship, the importance of how that starts. I, I understand IGB is no longer taught. Right. So my question is, if we as a group of people who for 30 years have been out in all of these different sectors, think that, that, that the skills, those soft people, leadership skills, are some of the most important things we learned and the things we learned, wish we'd learn more of. What is SOM doing to get this next generation um, to, to have even more of those skills rather than less? Good, perfect. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, when I first came, I, I tried to talk about a, a, what I viewed as a shifting from two to three. And I, I, I think of business school education as traditionally relying on, on two fundamentals. One is, and this refers to the other thing you talked about, people coming to business schools really need to understand how markets work, competition. Um, there's competition everywhere. 
So, so you know, and I, it, it's not just non, you know, for-profit or entrepreneur uh, people. It's it's everybody. You, everybody faces competition, hiring, influence, etc. So, that's that's one paradigm. The other is organizations, teams, leadership. So, those two things are what has really driven the MBA to prominence, and everybody knows probably that the MBA is the most popular master's program by far in the world. It's 25% of graduate degrees now. And it's because people come out and they understand how markets work and they understand how organizations work. But I also think, and this goes beyond your question, I think people need to understand something else so that they just don't look at the org chart or look at the spreadsheet they need to connect and uh, particularly extend your question about leadership, teamwork to across the university to connect to big issues and globally. So yesterday, there happened to be a discussion in the context of these global network weeks and our students and students around the network were doing their team presentations, and it was just so cool to have a student from Ireland hand off to a student from India, hand off to a student here at Yale, and this kind of teamwork is very hard to, to replicate. In some ways, it was baked into the process, but that's, that's really exciting. It's not the same course, but we also have the negotiation course, we also have the leadership development program that uh, Tom Kolditz has developed. So it's, you know, I think there's a huge emphasis on exactly those skills. Um, do we have it right? No. And I just wanted to go back and maybe round out what it is that we like from alumni. And we already had one question on support for uh, students and alumni in terms of career support. So I have five things that I like you to do. <laughs> One is alumni career support. Second is feedback. And I would very much like you to you know, understand what we're doing and see if we're doing it well. Um, third is to, to contribute intellectually to the school, which many of you do. Contribute to clubs, et cetera. Fourth is to understand our, you know, what's up here. We're still committed very much. Some people some, you know, come up and say, does the mission matter? The mission matters. The students, number one thing I get on this quirkiness is students are attracted to the school because of the business and society thing. They just, you know, they just resonate with us. You know, why do they come to this place? They say business and society. That's the first thing they say. So, uh, to, to be knowledgeable about the aspirations, I think, is, is something that I would love to have the alumni um, get to the point where they say, yeah, the, these aspirations are, are really driving a lot of the school. You may not uh, like every aspect of the execution, but, you know, Peter mentioned the joint degree programs with the forestry school and the law school. We have 15% joint degree students in the entering class. It's pretty amazing. It's mm -hmm. double our competitors. We've just launched the new entrepreneurship program. Seven new classes. Our approach is open these classes up to the rest of the university. Kyle Jensen, our director, says you don't start a company with 10 MBAs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people can, there are a lot of things that you can find within what we're doing to say, you know, I'm proud of this school. The Global Network Weeks to position our students so they're, they're connected, not just the executive MBAs, but the full-time MBAs connected to Africa, connected to Asia, connected to Europe, connected to places like Turkey, a very pivotal country. So be knowledgeable. And then last, yeah, give to the annual fund. <laughs> we had 45% of the alumni give to the annual fund, no knock on the rest of Yale. That was the highest annual fund rate throughout Yale. 
So congratulations to our alumni. <laughs> Sorry to hijack your question, uh, yeah. but, uh, but teamwork and negotiation feedback is one of my most important themes. And, and this fall, we're looking for feedback on aspiration two. We're two and a half years into this strategy. So if you have comments, I really want, we're, we're trying to get co comments from a thousand people. And then the scale and scope, David Bach, just raise your hand here. David and Andrew Metrick are talking about scale and scope tomorrow, and we want a lot of feedback on that too, so thank let you. Me, let me just add one quick thought to uh, the question here. Uh, I think many of the issues in, in uh, first of all, I've heard many alumni talk about that course uh, you know, as, as very, a me very meaningful part of their education. And, and I think the question really is not, does that course still exist? The question is, are those issues still part of the curriculum, and uh, I'm not an expert on SOM's curriculum, but when I come over, I see things like students uh, taking uh, assessments of emotional intelligence and learning about themselves and their emotional strengths and weaknesses. Some of you know that's an uh, area of particular interest to me. I see courses and faculty teaching on issues like gender and power in the workplace. I see uh, negotiation, I see, you know, so um, I, I think it's there, it's in, in, in new forms, but I don't think you know, there may have been a time, uh, we, we don't have to relive it, there may have been a time in the history of SOM where there was a bit of hostility to all of that, and we're not in one of those now. Okay, who's next? How about right here? And then, and then here, so here and then here. Yes. Thank you, uh, I'm Dick Tavelli, class of 79. There are a few of us here. Uh, two comments uh, on the quirkiness, um, and uh, President Salve uh, related to this. In the early, early years, we were not a business school. We were a school of organization and management, and the world and we struggled to figure out what we were going to be and how we were going to be reaching those goals. So I think that was part of it in terms of the quirkiness. Now, uh, we've, we've moved beyond that. Uh, there are a few uh, dinosaurs like myself who've retained their MPPM degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, uh, everyone, after the first five years, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't sweat. We, we had the core <laughs> skills and the faculty, and uh, as we used to tell one another, hey, this is Yale. So anyway, I want to just point that out in terms of the quirkiness. There really was that issue of just what it is you're going to be. And we've moved successfully beyond that. Now, to the other point about uh, recruiting, uh, if you're a smaller company, I happen to have the privilege of coming back to SOM in 1999 as an alumni career advisor. And Dean Garten asked me back because uh, it was the uh, dot-com boom and then bust. Uh, some of you may remember that. And the faculty was very afraid that all of our brilliant students were going to run off and try and become dot-com millionaires. Uh, so anyway, I've been doing turnaround of uh, early stage companies for 12 years at that point. That is, after the initial foray and all the money was spent and all the fun was had, uh, what do you do with this wreck? So anyway, I came back and I started uh, uh, to build resources in the career development office. I was a full-time uh, uh, career advisor along with my colleague, David Berkheim, class of 84, who's sitting right over there. Classmates. Um, and uh, so I want to applaud the initiative that you've taken to really uh, bring greater resources to this, to the entrepreneurial program that you touched on. I don't know if anyone was able to watch the webinar or read about it, but it's really tremendous and it's bringing a lot more institutional resources to provide that for people who are interested in that. And in the old days we used to say you were doing an uh, uh, not on-campus search, but your own self-directed search, and that's really what uh, uh, a lot of these folks ended up doing. But with the greater skills and the greater uh, uh, number of people in those programs and following those uh, courses, taking the negotiations, the other courses, I think it really lays a, a very good predicate. But not all jobs are going to be found here on campus, and uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs end up finding their own way anyway. And I think those skills are going to be reinforced by the kind of expanded program that you initiated. So it's a very good effort, in my view. Thank you. So one, one very quick comment. I think your, 
your reflections uh, underscore a point that I think is very dear to the school, which is in addition to the small and quirky nature of the school, and let's get the next question queued up, um, the school has always been willing to take on new things mm -hmm. and evolve and be an entrepreneurial uh, school and chart a different course. And that's really been, uh, it's been fun for me to be here. This is a school that's not just locked down and it's not just hygiene and, and polishing. Hello. Hi, I'm Carlos Pineda of School Management and School Forestry from 99 and 2000. So really appreciate the comments on the joint degree. <clears throat> and I have a, a comment and then a, a question. Um, the, the comment is first, you know, the Yale uh, alumni uh, are an incredible force in the environmental field, um, both on in management side and uh, all, you know, sides of society of, of civil and NGOs and business. Um, so one of the things we're doing um, as joint degrees, uh, I'm the, uh, the co-chair of a conference called Yale Environmental Sustainability Summit that we're gonna be having uh, in November 6th and 7th next year. The idea is to bring these leaders back to Yale and have a moment to talk about what we're doing and the challenges. I mean, we have such an incredible cadre out there, and so this is a moment for us all to come back and, and work together. So I hope any of you that are interested in this field will join us November 6th and 7th of next year. It's gonna be quite an event. Um, and we've received incredible uh, response from SOM and Forestry and Center for Business and Environment. It's really it's gonna gaining here. steam. Yeah, it's gonna be here. It's gonna mm -hmm. be here. <laughs> and uh, it's really gaining steam across, across Yale. So that's exciting. And then my question is, uh, you know, these issues, climate change being a big one, also we're seeing, you know, low carbon businesses and green businesses becoming predominant employers in many parts of the country. Um, what, is, what is the, you know, role of the university in tackling sustainability challenges? And how, do, how does the university work with SOM, schools like SOM, also forestry, in, in tackling those challenges and preparing leaders uh, to be effective in this field. Well, I think this is an opportunity to talk about the task force that you've commissioned, but um, Peter, what do you think? So, uh, first of all, I, I appreciate your characterization that Yale is very strong in sustainability and environment. Uh, we, you know, we want to be strong in a, in a few different ways, right? One is through education programs like the one you were in. Uh, one is through supporting the best kind of research in this area, uh, primarily in our forestry school, but really throughout uh, the university. Uh, and then the last is by practicing what we preach. So building buildings that are LEED certified, uh, uh, our own uh, approach to energy uh, consumption, uh, getting students involved in uh, uh, new ways of, um, of uh, reducing Yale's carbon footprint, et cetera. But we, uh, you know, we were asked by a group of undergraduates to uh, divest uh, the endowment from uh, 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 fossil fuel companies. And putting aside for a minute the politics of that debate, that goes to a corporation committee. Uh, they follow a very principled way of making the decision whether to do that or not. They follow a book written by John Simon called The Ethical Investor. And they made the decision not to divest, but they encouraged us to think about what else could we do at Yale in this area that would be different. And uh, in addition to doing things that aren't so unusual, like, uh, well, voting proxies, or um, uh, you know, setting aside funds for green initiatives on campus, we're doing a couple of things that are pretty different. And one, I think this is uh, the committee you're talking about, one is to put together a committee chaired by Bill Nordhaus, an economist who's written a lot on carbon charges, uh, that would think about whether Yale could be a test bed for whether carbon taxes actually change behavior and offer the, you know, some, I think most economists think the answer to that is yes, uh, uh, but uh, what if we try it here? What, what you know, how, we'll learn something about implementation, we'll learn something about consequences. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that we could do that's quite different. I should add, by the way, that David Swenson, our incredible endowment manager 
who just had another fantastic year, uh, wrote actually to his uh, outside managers this year and said, we're not divesting, but uh, the carbon footprint of what your company does is relevant as a business consideration with respect to whether our, uh, it's wise for us to be investing in you or not, and we take it into consideration. And so that's a little different approach. It's, it's saying uh, that, that we think of it as an investment decision in, in, in part. Anyway, that has now become something that other places are imitating too, uh, who don't want to politicize their endowment, but also want to be responsible investors. And so I answered this in a few different ways, but um, this, is, this is still a hotbed of where, uh, of where uh, uh, sustainability envi and, and environmentalism uh, and of course the larger implications for climate change can come together with business uh, and, and other parts of the university. I think uh, still very strong in this area. Chris Galvin is giving me the time uh, <laughs> sign. Um, we are uh, so delighted that you're here. Um, re really appreciate it. I'm gonna hang around and just see if there are uh, some questions I can take informally. Um, going back to uh, the, the, the feedback uh, question or, you know, I just wanna tell you my email's not Edward Snyder. <laughs> There's a, there's a doctor who's been at Yale for like three <laughs> decades. He, I, I go over and buy him coffee. <laughs> Calm him down. <laughs> and just say, th he's such a nice guy. <laughs> but he, you know, he took, he took my, what would have been my email. So my email is... Wait, wait, you, got, you got to ask him to, to stop admitting students to us. It's called... He, he accepts the truth it. behind our expansion. He accepts. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. So, anyways, uh, <laughs> comments, questions. Uh, T T Snyder. So T Snyder at Yale.edu, and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>